Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 53 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, I was delighted to chat with the partial historians, both Dr. Greenfield and Dr. Radford. This week presented me with a fun and unique opportunity to record a rare three-person podcast. Dr. G holds a PhD in classics and ancient history and specializes in the Vestal Virgins and the Age of Augustus, while Dr. Rad holds a PhD in ancient history and specializes in classical reception and the 1960 Spartacus film. They have both taught extensively in subjects such as ancient history, modern history, and English literature, and together they host the popular Roman history podcast, The Partial Historians. In this episode, we chatted about how the pandemic helped renew interest in classics, about differences between the Aussie and U.S. educational systems and specializations, and got a little behind the scenes of how they started the Partial Historians podcast and what inspires them. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Thank you both for joining me. I know it's like evening there in Australia, and it's like weird and sunny and very very hot here in the UK so yeah I just want to jump right in and I'm gonna ask how did both of you get into classics discover it and decide that it's something that you wanted to like study and pursue more than just have it be a side passion all right I'll go first (laughs) I see Fiona is holding back (laughs) I think I've always been interested in history and so I think that as a child I was always fascinated by people from all through time and it kind of didn't really matter geographically where I was really fascinated by everywhere and every type of people that I could come across and read about so it was kind of like everything to do with the Egyptians everything to do with South America I was into everything and I didn't realize, I I think I told this story recently to somebody, but we were doing um, a little bit of reading um, for the Herodotus marathon that was quite recently. And I took off the shelf, my copy of Herodotus, which I hadn't opened up in years. And the the docket fell out, the receipt from having purchased it. And I'd bought it when I was a teenager. I hadn't even left high school yet. So there was a little bit of something there, I think, that suggested that's where I was going to end up. And I went into a degree which wasn't history at university to start off with. And I was about halfway through that degree when I realized I was really loving all of my electives far more than my core subjects, all of my history subjects, all of my literary subjects. And I really made the decision then to be like, I'm just going to pursue history and the ancient past for as long as I can, as far as I can. And I'll just see what happens. I suppose I can get a job later. You know, it's been a part of my life the whole way through and it's it's been amazing. It's like my love for history hasn't diminished over time. It's increased. I spend more time reading about history as the course of my life unfolds. It's It's kind of fantastic. So it's a constant companion for me. And I fell into history ass backwards. So I wouldn't say that I'm a classicist because anybody who listens to our show knows I am terrible with languages. I leave that to Dr. G. (laughs) I consider myself more an ancient historian. I also really loved history at school and I particularly started having a passion for it when I was in year 11 and 12 because I had this insane but amazing teacher who would wear like Cleopatra, Elizabeth Taylor eyeshadow to every class and all this Egyptian style gold jewelry. She was great and she inspired me a lot. But when I graduated, I actually got into criminology at the University of Sydney. And I also was interested in going to NIDA, which is a acting school in Australia. I took a year off and I started doing history as a backup for if acting didn't work out. (laughs) But I ended up really enjoying history and I just kind of continued to do it without any real plan or forethought. <laughs> hey, that's that's a fantastic idea. Also, I love that history 
was the backup for acting when most people I think would be like, uh, you're going to want to back up to your history degree because that yeah, will do yeah, nothing exactly, for you. Yeah. <laughs> it says a lot about my intellectual level <laughs> in general. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was either that or you just believed in yourself so much that so confident that either the acting was really going to take off or that the history was going to take off and it was going to become solid job oh I did I've I've had an Oscars speech written since I was about 14 I was pretty confident <laughs> okay okay I like it I like it I'm like I'm so you don't win an Oscar I'm gonna be really sad because I want to know what you've had written since you were 14 I, I, I'm hoping that I'll be able to Judy Dench it yeah <laughs> Either that or we'll just have to win a podcast award and I'll just slightly adapt. Although it might be weird when I thank Marilyn Monroe, but hey. <laughs> well, well, you could you could consult on some award-winning film and then you can give the Oscar speech when you win, like, best adapted screenplay because you've taken some ancient historical thing, adapted it, and helped be a consultant. So there, there are ways. Absolutely. There are ways. Yeah, absolutely. It'll ha- it'll happen. It'll, it'll happen. happen. I want to see this happen because I want to hear that speech. Goodness <laughs> me. So I don't know how it is in Australia, and I'm hoping you will enlighten me, us, my audience, whoever. I mean, in the, growing up in the States, you really get the sense that, like, they tell you all the time, no, history is not profitable. You don't want to go into it. And then you inevitably get, you know, the speech from your parents that are like, no don't do this. You'll be poor and miserable and have no money and you will just hate your life and, and don't do it. And so you're, you know, tried to, 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 they try to talk you out of it. So did your parents ever, you know, give you, sit you down and give you the, the talk about, you know, money and, and, and like jobs and other things that, that might be more profitable than going into history? Well, given that my main goal in life, my whole, basically as long as I was, you know, a child was to be an actress, I think my parents were actually relieved when I said I wanted to do history as my backup. And uh, I also knew that I was probably likely to be a history teacher. So I was always doing it in conjunction with an education goal, I suppose. So yeah, I think they were kind of relieved that that was what I chose to do. So Whilst we were at university, though, we definitely got the speech about how nobody's going to need you as a history teacher. There's far too many history teachers out there. So you better learn geography or math or something that's useful because that's probably what you'll end up teaching. However, in the last couple of years, that has been proven to be completely incorrect because as there is, I think, all around the world, there is a massive teacher shortage of all kinds at the moment because people are leaving teaching in droves. So I've never had to worry. And that's, I'm very fortunate about that. <laughs> I feel like for me, I've, I was pretty lucky to be honest. Like my parents were pretty, this is going to reveal my age, parents of the eighties, because they were kind of like, we just want you to be happy. And I think that sets you up for all sorts of false expectations about what might be possible. Because when you say, oh, I'm going to try this. And they're like, oh, yeah, go for it. You know, if it makes you happy. (laughs) And it's definitely true that when I left high school and I started my first degree, I was thinking about practicalities because I surprised myself by getting a much higher mark in my final exams than I thought I was going to get. I thought I was going to get into a history degree, which was slightly lower entry than what the mark I ended up getting. So I opted for what I thought was a smart and practical choice to do the degree that I didn't expect to get into, but I put it at the top of my list just in case I aced things. Then realized that actually I can't live my life like that. Trying to follow a set of values that's really not consistent with exactly who I am is impossible for me. And I think it's impossible for everybody. I don't think I'm unique or special in this at all, but I think... For some people, the cycle of getting to that point where you trust your instinct to go for it and go with that thing that you love, it kicks in a lot later. So I think in some respects, really fortunate to have come to that decision quite early in like my mid twenties, rather than say in my mid forties and then gone, oh no, I'm having a midlife crisis. I needed to be a historian all of this time, Uh, which, you know, would still be fine, but I'm really glad that I decided much earlier that that was going to be the path I pursued. But it is the case, definitely, that if not for family, definitely the state 
government is all about STEM. They don't care about humanities. They make that very, very clear. Despite all of the evidence of the value of humanities and the arts and everything to do with the amount of people that are interested, the crowds that exhibitions draw, all of that sort of thing, they don't seem to count any of that. They're like, if you're not being an accountant, if you're not becoming a lawyer, you know, if you're not becoming a doctor, you're not contributing to society in some way. And it's such a falsehood. There is a real richness, I think, in trying to understand people. And history is a real great mechanism for that. And wherever you end up specializing, whether it's classics, whether it's the ancient world more in general, the ancient world broadly outside of the Mediterranean, because there's a lot that you can study about the ancient past that's not so focused on that Eurasian type of aspect, then there is such richness there. I don't know. I get really angry about the government. but I think we've definitely seen that during lockdown, what people tended to turn to for amusement or for solace were the arts. And so it is really sad when governments don't value it. It's not that we're saying you have to value it more than STEM, but there definitely has to be a balance. It's got to be STEAM. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I disagree. I dislike STEAM. <laughs> STEAM can... Steam can go and rot. I'm sorry. I'm not going to have the arts just thrown in there as if it's somehow an add-on to STEM. It's not. It's its own thing. STEM can have its own room and arts can have its own room. No way. (laughs) All right. Well, okay. Put me in my place. I mean, no, it's it's, it's valid, but it's also interesting because, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm an archaeo gamer and so I'm, I'm, always talking about no we need to mix them we can mix history we can you know i think that both history and stem fields do actually have a lot to 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 interact and and talk to each other so i'm curious now wait so if you don't want steam how do you envision them sort of well the thing is i don't want arts to be subsumed into this bigger thing like stem has got four letters and they're all they all like sort of align with each other it's like they're all related to each other and then they're like arts just gets one letter in that i'm like i'm sorry no they're literally four letters for the things that art covers because it needs to be balanced and i don't disagree with the value of things like arco gaming at all like i think Assassin's Creed Odyssey was the thing that got me through the first lockdown. I just wandered around in that open world and I was very, very happy to do that because I didn't even, I was like, sometimes I did a side quest, but most of the time I was just ignoring all the quests. I just wanted to feel like I was exploring on foot somewhere when I couldn't go anywhere. And the landscape is beautiful in that game. Um, But there's that rich history that comes with that sort of stuff as well. And it's like, there's no way you could have a game like that be as compelling as it is if there wasn't a lot of history involved and a lot of artistry and even computer gaming itself all of the graphic interface that's all art that's true that's true i i think that game got a lot of people through lockdowns which is funny because you know when i think about it i'm like but it came out in 2018 so it came out clearly before but i feel like i've never heard as many people talk about the assassin's creed games until the pandemic and you know that just made me feel all i hate to say it, but i felt a little self-righteous where i was like yes and see people don't turn to those math textbooks in a lockdown you turn to historical escapism you know people are playing all the assassin's creed and i'm like ah that's not just ancient greece it, it's all the different periods of history but i'm like it proves people are wanting to escape to history so i was like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know i would it would it, i'd be hard pressed not to start gloating about how people would turn to to historical escapism and uh it's actually it's funny because when people uh heard that i was starting a podcast in 2020 that was on classics people were like come on like that's awesome for you we know you like it but come on there's not really an audience for that right and i was like have you seen how many people are into history things so if i put out one more i'm sure there will be an audience and luckily i did but there is so many, so many people and like and there's such diversity in what is possible with history as well as like you're bound to find listeners. I think. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, I want to go a little bit back, you know, when you sort of make these decisions about, OK, do I specialize in classics because, you know, you have to have the languages or do you go more generalized like ancient history because you can sort of avoid them, which is totally what I wanted to do. You know, is it different in Australia? Like 
I don't know how they do the languages uh, in school. I know in, in the States, though, you know, I wasn't required to take anything more than one foreign language in high school. Most places don't offer Latin. I was super pissed because my high school was kind of a specialized college prep and they had Latin. And so I chose to go to that school based on the fact that they had Latin. And then the year that I started was the first year that they had taken away the Latin program. So I could not take Latin and I had to take French, which was fine, but I was still mad. It was not fine. Don't be like <laughs> it that. wasn't fine. I was not happy. And I think I cried to my mom or complained and I was just like, this is the whole reason I chose to go to this school because it was like one of two options in the city of Chicago that would let me take Latin. And I unfortunately did not test high enough to get into the other school that had latin so i was like nah this was this was my shot and i didn't get to do it and i just had to keep doing french which was fine but you know (laughs) so (laughs) so in australia is the system a little better where you're encouraged to take or have the opportunity to take uh, more no Uh uh-oh no no i wouldn't say so i mean in australia the system is obviously a little different to in the states and i wouldn't say that our universities are quite as insane as the American university system in terms of the expense. That, that's definitely not something that is characteristic of Australia, although it still still costs money, obviously. But there's, yeah, it's just not as expensive. In America, obviously, it's like crazy. But basically, there is a division between the public and the private system in Australia. So a public school is a state-funded school, and that's where you just go to the school that's in your area. So your postcode determines the school that you go to. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're obviously going to wind up in a bad school. There are some amazing public schools and you can find yourself with amazing teachers, amazing resources and amazing year group. It can all be great. But there is also this private system, which is where obviously parents opt based on the, you know, whatever the school says it is, the characteristics of the school that they're going to pay to send their school, their, their child to that particular school. It is more likely, I think, that you will encounter Latin in a private school system. I say that because Dr. G and I both went to public schools and I don't think I had any awareness that Latin was a possibility. Not that I necessarily was smart enough to take it back then because I had no aspirations of becoming a Roman historian at that point in time, but it wasn't definitely wasn't a thing that was mentioned. We basically did pretty entry-level language stuff where we did about six months of Japanese and like six months of French and we basically learned to count and that was the extent of my language experience unless I'd opted to do it in year 11 and 12 which again stupidly I did not and now as an adult I have taught exclusively in the private sector and now that I'm in that sector I can see the amount of preparation that goes into that those students education and certainly things like Latin are definitely on offer And so I can understand how when I got to university and started doing introductory Latin and I found it so difficult, I can understand why other people weren't because they would have done it all in high school already. (laughs) Oof, yikes. I mean, I swear, the the languages are just hard everywhere because there's just so little access to them, which is so unfair and so sad. But obviously, I get why you would need an emphasis on like modern foreign language instead. Because I mean, when they took away Latin, they replaced it with... I think it was Mandarin at that time. So I was like, okay, I mean, I get it from like a world utility standpoint, you know, with businesses and stuff all going through China now. I was like, okay, I understand adding that. But like, I don't know. I just felt like my school hung on to like languages that I, 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 they're not useless per se, but I was like, why would you have that instead of, I mean, they had, they had Italian and I was like, that's great. And I mean, if you want to go to Italy and speak Italian, fantastic. But I was just like, why would, why, why? I mean, I just think it would be cooler to have that. <laughs> it seems like the choices might be a little bit arbitrary. <laughs> it really was. It really was. Although, I mean, I had friends who were equally as pissed because when they took Latin, they took the German program away as well. And I was like, well, I mean, OK, I was kind of like thinking, you know, OK, well, who outside of Germany actually speaks German? <clears throat> like nobody. So I was like, OK, I, I get that. But but yeah, so she was equally as mad. And I was just like, well, you can't please everyone and you can't have all the languages. So but it, but it just seems like it's really common now that you would only have like French, Spanish, Chinese. And if you're lucky, another language, which always is chosen very arbitrarily. Yeah, we, we yeah, I think it's really tricky because it does set up a system of 
inequity right from the beginning, though. So if you were to have exposure to to Latin earlier on in your education, it it is advantageous. It's just you've got that extra those extra years of experience to bring to the subject for students in Australia, and I would say the majority of them, um, the private sector is still a smaller proportion of the student population, although they tend to be more likely to have been offered Latin. For students going into it here, it's like the the amount of time that you spend in your language prep um, outside of class time is pretty intense in order to get to that catch up point. I feel like the time that I was actually really good at Latin, and I wouldn't say that I am right now. I would say that when I was good at Latin, I was doing it four hours a day to try and stay up on top of it and to have it in my system as a language I was doing. And that's a huge ask of anybody, uh, let alone somebody in their like mid twenties who's like, I just want to, I just want to keep studying Rome, guys. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that was the same for me. As Dr. G said, it's not that it's impossible that you'll do Latin in a public school. Absolutely not. As I say, there are lots of fantastic public schools in Australia. But it is, I think, something you're a little bit more likely to offer at a private school. And I certainly had to put in a huge amount of work just to get a basic understanding of Latin by the time I got to university. So that is why I knew I wasn't destined for the classics. I just considered myself an ancient historian. Having said that, though, even doing ancient history... I definitely think that having languages on your side is a, is a plus and it's something you probably should do. It just was honestly something beyond my capabilities because when I was at university, again, I'm not from a super elite background. I had to work and I had to have a job as well as studying. And so I didn't have the time to spend or the money to spend on a tutor or anything like that. So it was just what I could do in the time that I had. And languages just was not my priority because I knew it was something I was going to have to spend an enormous amount of time on if I was ever going to master it and I knew I didn't have that time. Yeah, I mean, you know, the languages are always the barrier. I mean, in every single conversation I've now had on the podcast, I think it comes down to everyone just says it's the languages, it's the way we teach, it's the way that our systems are set up, you know, it's so hard. And this is just Latin we're talking about, which is more widely, I mean, this is this is ignoring Greek completely, which, you know, nobody really has. I mean, you, you've got to be so lucky if you've got, you know, Greek. So it, it just reinforces my resolve to change that damn system because the way it is, is just, it's not, it's not workable for a lot of people. And, you know, it's, it's such a shame, but, you know, kind of along with that though, you know, I'm curious to know where you guys stand on certain programs now making the languages uh, optional rather than a requirement, you know, like, will that actually help people get into ancient history or classics you know is it bad like like what are what are we you know what are we feeling I don't I'm trying to get a a good read on on that yeah I think it's a tricky one you go Dr. Rad well I was I was going to say I really enjoyed all the history that I studied and having said all the things I said about languages I wouldn't change the degree that I took or the path that I have taken because in a way, because I wasn't really gifted with languages, it directed me down a path that I think was probably more suited to me than academia. I think academia would have been too much for my self-esteem to take. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I just don't think it probably would have worked out for me if I had gone down that path, at least straight away. I think going into history teaching and then also finding the partial historians and podcasting and doing all the stuff that we've done with that has actually been far more suited to my talents. <laughs> I don't think you should necessarily mandate that people have to do really high levels of languages because then that bars people like me from doing it and they're not necessarily doing it to become an academic. Personally, I think, yeah, it, there's got to be a way for people to study history without having to do lots and lots of languages However, I definitely would say, knowing what I know now, that if you were planning to become an academic, then yeah, sure, you probably do need to have pretty high level of languages. Start from birth. Uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Start preparing. You need French, Read German, Latin, Latin and to the Latin. baby yeah. in the womb. <laughs> if you're not on Cicero by the age five, just forget about it. <laughs> Honestly, you know, yeah, just just put the headphones to like 
you know, mommy's belly and then just play audiobook of like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid and just, you know, make sure, okay, starting him early. Yeah. Establish yeah. the classics early on, you know? Yeah. All the classics, not <laughs> just, you know, ancient history, just, just, you know, play Mozart all the time. Just put the, you know, headphones again on the belly, play the Mozart, play the Bach, just be like, okay, you're going to be very educated. Don't let them out until they can do unseen translations. <laughs> they can't be born yet they're not ready <laughs> yeah look i think it's really tricky obviously like to go down an academic path you have to be able to have a sense of confidence in your language abilities or choose a path through um, an academic journey that allows you to do the languages less there's various things that are sort of easier and harder if you like you know it's like reading epigraphy is not as much of an onerous burden as trying to like come up with like the next great translation of the Aeneid or or something like that. So, you know, like not that you're, you would necessarily consider yourself to be less or more in tune with the language, but there's a different like auxiliary skill sets that go around with stuff like that. I always think about reception studies as being like really fertile ground because It's a place where your understanding of the past and understanding of the classics is useful and good, but your need to engage with the ancient languages is maybe not as necessary as your ability to reinterpret the way other people are engaging with translation. So that sort of opens up different paths as well. Which is why I ended up being in reception studies. (laughs) (laughs) I, that that is that is yeah that's not a I'm not dismissing reception studies at all I, I you know it's it's one of those things I think it's really valuable and good yeah that's what I mean that's why that's why I went down that path because I was like yeah no like, I'm not gonna be translating anything <laughs> but it is that sort of thing where it's like there are moments where it can be really useful from a just a, a question perspective that you have at his as a historian to be like, I need to go back to the original language for this. Like I definitely do most of the work with the podcast through translation. Don't have time to translate myself, you know, like I pull translations and I read them and that's, that's good and useful. And so the work that we do is really benefited, benefited from the fact that other people have done that really hard language labor. And, but there are moments when even in translation where you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't quite gel with my understanding of the ancient past or like, you know, something about Roman society is like, oh, ooh, I've got a question about that. I need to see what, what it is in the original language just so that I've got a reference point to be able to satisfy my curiosity. And in those moments, even if the language skills are a bit rusty, if you've got all of your tools and you're like, I can whip out my lexicon, I, let's drag out the dictionary, you know, the big fat one. And, you know, like, let's do some comparisons here. That's really actually satisfying work to be able to satisfy your curiosity about things. So I don't think you want no language training because it it sort of leaves you at a a real disadvantage of having to always rely on the translator. So I think you do want that sense of confidence. Is it necessary to always be at the highest level in the languages to be able to get the most out of how you do history and, and what you take away from it? I don't think so. Definitely not. Everybody loves history. Do they all translate Latin? No. Surely not. I ask this only because I know that within the last year, the Princeton Classics Department obviously made a a pretty monumental decision to make the languages optional for their, um, and they created a completely separate track within the Classics Department for just people want to do like ancient sieves and and not do the languages. And so, yeah, I've sort of been observing how that's gone and it's it's really interesting to hear a diverse range of opinions on it because i have the people who are definitely in the corner of this was fantastic because if you know you want to go on in academia or if you are curious about the languages it's not that they're taking them away you can still take them and if you know that you want to absolutely go on to graduate school then you will take them but i guess i also approach it because i was one of those students who i had just by chance taken ap french in my final year of high school. And then when I got to college, they just said, oh, well, technically you can transfer your AP credit and you don't have to take a language to graduate because you've satisfied it. If you want to take a language, you can. And I did what most classics majors are encouraged to do, which is starting an ancient language. So I, I took a semester of ancient Greek 
and then just because of how my schedule went and then I had some health issues and, and other things together, that's all I ended up being able to do. So I always feel a little guilty because I did earn my bachelor's in classics. It says classics, but I have a semester of ancient Greek and I didn't even get to Latin. And so I'm always like, oh, okay, do I get to call myself that? Should I call myself something else? I'm not really sure. This is really, really awkward for me. It's on the piece of paper. You can definitely. Exactly. So I'm like, I mean, you know, I was like, I, cause, cause I, I did want to focus on like the, the ancient civ, the ancient history track anyway. And so even if I had to take more language and I'd gotten the opportunity, I think, you know, I'm not sure if I would have actually, because I mean, I like language. I like learning them on my own time. I would like to go back and learn Latin and uh, do more ancient Greek, but I don't like the sort of rapid pace. You have to do them in a classroom setting at school right so I'd, I'd much rather have a private tutor or do self-study or something where I could go at my own pace and so because of the way it's taught in school you know I was kind of like I'm not unhappy that I didn't have to take anything else to get that degree <laughs> so I guess just from from you know where I stand I'm kind of like well I think it's great you know so I was definitely I would always say I'm one of those kids who I would look at a classics degree and say oh yeah I absolutely want to do this I want to get that degree but I don't want to do the languages I definitely just want to stick to the ancient history part because I know I'm not going to go on to do grad work if I knew that then I'd go take the languages so yeah it's been interesting to hear some people say no no, no we should still kind of require them but maybe just one class and then have other people be like nah 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 nah, nah. just make it completely you know if you want to take it take it but don't force people to take them at all so I think it's great to give people the choice I think it's also important to give people the information that they need to be able to make the best decision for their future mm -hmm. path so the longer that you don't do the languages and it turns out that actually the path that you want requires them and it's like you're, you're playing a lot of catch up and definitely even in our situations or at least in my situation I felt like by the time I realized when I got to university how much I needed those languages and how little opportunity I'd ever had to be able to study them before I felt like it was grossly unfair um, to be in a situation where I was so far behind through no fault of my own, it was like there was never an option to do Latin or Greek at high school um, where I went. It just wasn't on offer. And to find out partway through that the reason why these kids were having such an easy time of it is because they're, they're, they'd all come from private schools and they'd all had a very different education from me. It just felt hugely unfair. And I was like, it made me angry. It made me want to fight for my degree. And it made me want to prove them all wrong. And so, you know, the little, the stubbornness inside me started to come out. <laughs> valid, valid. Yeah, but there's, there's also something to be said, though, for the fact that the more that I know about languages and translations and all of that kind of stuff, which I admit is all secondhand because I am useless with languages, I feel like for a lot of people to actually do translations well, they have to be such a specialist in not just Latin, but that time period for Latin, that author. They have to get to know that author's voice. It requires such an insane degree of specialization that surely there's got to be people that obviously choose to do that, but then there've got to be people that also don't. You know, you, you couldn't, I, I know people who have studied Latin for a really long time and yet they still probably wouldn't feel super confident to like do a translation. It, it's quite a specialist thing. And so sometimes I think it would be best if there were people who would be like, yep, I'll be the Homer person and uh, I'll take Cicero. And then you work with those people who have that specialized knowledge and can produce the best translations and they can, and that you can actually collaborate. It doesn't have to be, you do it all. You know everything on your own. You're that kind of academic. Like, why does it have to be that way? Humans are all about collaborating and sharing knowledge. Why does it have to be all on one person to be this like genius academic that can just do everything. It, it doesn't make sense. I think to this me. is where science actually, I, I will give them a compliment now because they're very, they do collaborate a lot and yes. I would love to see more multiple author papers come through in classics and ancient history. You're starting to see some co-authored papers. It's taken a long time to get there though. <laughs> Yeah, what happened to the old collaboration is key. Two heads are better than one. All these like snappy, like, you know, things we say. But I'm like, but it's true. They, we say them for a reason. Yeah, I would love to see more collaboration. Yeah, that's right. You know, until this moment, I hadn't really thought about 
how much academics and classics or ancient history don't like to collaborate unless they have to because it's just too much work to do on their own. It's almost <laughs> like you're forced into yeah. it. I hate that. <laughs> well, I feel like it's also I feel like it's also a, a bit of a self esteem thing in terms of either what you're trying to live up to or maybe the image of the academic that we've been presented with. So I, I don't blame anybody for not doing that, but I'm just, when I was doing it and I was struggling with languages, I was like, well, this is crazy. I'm focusing on a movie and okay, yeah, my Latin and Greek suck, but why can't I collaborate with somebody who's good at that? Why should I have to spend like a year or two trying to get good enough to do the translations of these passages that I need? It's it's insane that 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 was the case. Like I, that's just not what I'm focusing on. And I was lucky in that I did have academics who were happy to help me out and and share their expertise because otherwise I would have been completely up the creek. But yeah, I just I just thought why why is that such a shameful thing that I had to say? You know what? Not so good with the languages. I could really use your help here because I need these three sentences translated. Why why does that have to be such a bad thing? I I saw it, I saw it as a good thing. Yeah. It comes down to like a cultural thing, I think, about the way that classics in particular holds itself to a particular standard. It's built up an idea of itself over time. And you see it, that it's insidious and it can be really poisonous. You see it at conferences and the way that people can treat each other in this particular discipline because of the history and the, and the sort of the cultural cachet that comes with it. It, it's really quite detrimental, I think. Yeah, I just feel like we'd all be happier if we could just say, if we could just be open about it and just say, you know what, I could really use some help. You know, let, let's not stress ourselves out over translations. Let's let's go to the people that have the expertise and it's not a bad thing and it's not it's nothing to be embarrassed about. <laughs> I mean, you're preaching to the choir. I mean, you know, as a, as a <laughs> classicist who didn't really take more than a semester of ancient Greek, I'm always running to friends being like, Hi, so I know it's a bit crazy, but I'm doing a classics thing and um, I do need help with this. So can you just like help me? And I have quite a few friends with, who, who have done quite well in the languages who are like, yeah, I'm really glad you asked. I'm like, oh, OK, so they're actually happy when you go to them and say, can you do this? Can you help? Assuming they have time, of course. But for the most part, if they do, they've been super happy to help out. So I'm like, I feel like just we could ask more people would actually be happy so uh, another thing i'm sort of uh, intrigued by is i was having a, a discussion with someone just not too long ago about how it seemed like classicists from the british and australian backgrounds and schools they go into the romans and you know they become latinists while a lot of americans are definitely the hellenists so kind of just like noticing that pattern and here I am with two Australians who are, you know, Latinists. I'm kind of like, so how did you make the decision? It, was it always just fascination with Rome because of, you know, X, Y, or Z? Or was there at some point a decision that had to be made that was pretty hard? Like, oh, I like Greece, but. No, it was always Rome. <laughs> <laughs> all, all roads lead to it, they say. <laughs> no, I um, basically and certainly yours did. <laughs> yeah, basically my high school teacher who really inspired me. I mean, as I say I liked history, but I don't think I'd ever really thought too much about where I was going to go with that because, of course, I was going to win an Oscar. So, what did school right. matter? And so it wasn't until I got into year eleven and I got this teacher, and I really, I just found it fascinating. But the thing that I particularly fell in love with was Tacitus, the Julia Claudians, and Agrippina the Younger. Actually, I should say Agrippina first, because she was really the one that hooked me. But certainly, Tacitus gets a lot of the credit for that. I just couldn't get enough, and I have never lost my fascination with that time period, or Tacitus, or Agrippina. Still love them to death, fascinated by them. And so it was never a question for me. I only did Greek history because it seemed necessary to have an understanding of the Romans, etc., I've definitely been a Roman through and through. <laughs> if you look at my transcript, you'll see that there's 75% Rome, 20% Greece, 5% Latin. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> wow. Oh, I'll come I'll back around to your the, the question about hard decisions because I, there are some. And I think there is a bit of a, a cultural explanation for why thing has played out the way that, it, that you've observed. But certainly... I didn't have to make a choice for a really long time. I was sure that I loved ancient 
Egypt when I was at high school because we studied that a lot. I did Roman Britain um, as one of my senior units, but I also did ancient Greece when I got to university. And I was pretty set on ancient Greece as I went into my history degree. I was like, yeah, this is going to be the thing. This is cool. I like the Athenians. They got some stuff going on. You know, I'd sort of like moved a little bit around from ancient Egypt and I was like, it's fine. And then I went to my first Roman lecture and it was Tom Hillard, who I now owe all of my specialization to really, because his enthusiasm as a first year lecturer was phenomenal. He had just a way of coming into a room that was electrifying for everybody. So you could not help but fall in love with ancient Rome because of the way that he taught it. Uh, He rocked up with a wheelbarrow with a a Roman head in it as part of his starting point to get everybody into the zone for what was going on. And so his passion for the subject made me want to pick more Roman history subjects. And the more I got into that, the more I wanted to do it. And that led into the honours project and that led into the PhD project. And the thing that happens that is inevitable is that you have to specialize. There's no way around that. You can't just keep being a generalist. People will ask you what your research topic is and you've got to come up with something really specific for that. And so things start to narrow down for you. And if you're in the Australian context, there's really only a few schools of thought that are in operation. And it's partly to do with the size of the country, like in terms of population and the size of the schools Um, within the university sector. So you end up in sort of uh, a situation where you've really got to choose quite specifically. And that's fine. That's kind of all that it is. And it's like, for some students, the path out of that is to do study overseas and to to do their PhD specialization elsewhere. And that's useful and good if like we definitely had Hellenists come through when I was studying and what they did was they did their masters in Australia and then they went overseas to do their PhD. The possibilities are open, but if you're staying in Australia, it's really about like, does your project really fit with the sorts of like academics that are around that you want to work with? And so that becomes the real key. So if you're happy to stay and do that specialization, then inevitably perpetuates itself at that point. <laughs> yeah, and I will I will agree with Dr. G there that we both did our undergraduate at Macquarie University and so we both owe a lot to Tom Hillard and Lee Burness because and, and the entire ancient history department there. They were always amazing, really, really inspiring teachers. No, that's good. You have to have inspiring teachers. It's it's quite funny actually when I was uh, so I did my undergrad at the University of Missouri and my two most energetic fun, amazing sort of mentors. They were Latinists through and through. And it was so funny because I loved them so much, but I I never liked the Romans. I never liked Rome. And it made them so sad because one of them, Dr. Maria Pietropaolo, love her. She was so, she taught an entire class just on the age of Augustus. And I think, I mean, she was so energetic and lovely. And so she was talking about uh, when we finally got to the unit where we were doing like res gestae. She was like, this is going to blow your mind. It's amazing. You're going to love it. I mean, I did that entire unit and then she was like, okay, what do you think? And I was like, oh, I hate the Romans. No, I don't like this at all. <laughs> no, no, no. So I was luckily not a disappointment to them, but they were just very sad that I didn't like Rome. Just a little more than half were all Hellenists. Like they just did not want to touch Rome with a 10 foot pole. And I don't know why. And so the more I like think back on my experience, I'm like, well, they didn't, there was no one at the university who was like, Greece is inherently better than Rome. Like, so I'm like, I don't know where this came from. I think I think the people who focus on ancient Greece are very satisfied because they don't have to do that much Latin. So they've got it easy. But like, if you're going to be a Roman historian, you still have to know Greek. That's true. That's true. Although, you know, you know, the, 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 the endless source of debate at school was, is ancient Greek or Latin the harder language to learn or the quote unquote more ancient fun Greek. one? So... <laughs> Yeah, I would say ancient Greek. I just look at that stuff and I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. I mean, my professor who taught me my semester of ancient Greek, he was fantastic though. He was like, it starts out much harder than Latin. Latin is so much easier to start. But he's like, 
but it's it gets easier so he was like latin starts easy and then it gets harder and he was telling us the whole time that greek it starts really hard but once you can get it, it gets easier and easier and um i mean he would talk i mean he would wax on for like 15 <laughs> 20 minutes in class about how greek is the most perfect beautiful thing and he's like it's it's the clarity he's like it's like putting on glasses when you didn't know you need them and i was like okay okay you're, you're yeah 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 and then and then i started taking ancient <laughs> greek and then i was like it's true though like the fact that like word order doesn't matter and then if you get past the declensions and you understand it's like oh, it makes some it was like alarm bells were going off and i was like this is the most beautiful thing i've ever looked at in my life and i love it and <laughs> So, you know, the one semester was not enough. And um, so I definitely want to go back and take more. But uh, when I knew that I was going to go into sort of more modern stuff, I started taking modern Greek. And then I learned that modern Greek is even easier than ancient Greek. And I was like, yes. So that's what I say is, is kind of what got me to, to do my master's in, uh, in Greece. Because I was just like, I'm just going to move to Greece and I'm going to learn Greek and I'm going to be in the culture. And, you know, uh, never been happier. So, so I did want to ask you guys, though, about starting Partial Historians. You know, how, what's the story behind starting it? Uh, you know, I don't know how many of my listeners will be familiar with your podcast so if you want to just outrageous describe it's clearly it, yeah. the dominant ancient history <laughs> podcast of the world <laughs> i know i'm like how Daddy. rude how rude if you're into romans at all you should know this podcast <laughs> you haven't you haven't studied ancient rome unless you've heard it told with australian accents i mean very true on. very true yeah <laughs> It started uh, almost 10 years ago now. We're coming up to our big anniversary, which is very exciting. So Dr. G and I actually knew each other because we both went to Macquarie University as undergrads, but we didn't like know, know each other. I recognized her. I knew what she looked like. I knew that we took a lot of the same classes, but I don't think we probably exchanged more than about 10 sentences. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I think we talked a couple of times, like there was a couple of times in honors year, I think that we had some chats. Perhaps, perhaps. Oh, no, it was just like a year of blind panic, so I might have blocked them from my memory. But then she went on to a different university. She went to the University of Sydney, which is also excellent, to do her PhD, and I remained at Macquarie. But we still came into contact with each other every now and then, and so we did move in the same circles. And then, as it so happened, we both became friends with this particular person who was going through a rough time. And because she was going through a rough time, Dr. G very kindly offered to throw a adult lady sleepover. (laughs) Therapeutic. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah, we were chatting at the sleepover and at that, by that stage, we'd both finished our PhDs and we were kind of pondering what the future held for us because we both realized that just in our very, our different but similar circumstances that we weren't probably going to go into academia. We could kind of see the writing on the wall there and it was in Latin and I couldn't read it. And so we decided uh, that we wanted to do something with our knowledge. We didn't want it to just fall away. We wanted to keep our hand in because I knew I was probably going to be a history teacher. I don't, don't know that, I don't know if you knew what you were going to do. I had no idea what I was going to do. <laughs> Yeah, so I knew I was probably going to be teaching a whole range of subjects that had absolutely nothing to do with what I had studied at university, which was all ancient Rome. So we started talking about potentially starting a YouTube channel, and then we met up with some uh, a guy who gave us some very useful advice about YouTube, which was basically, are you camera experts and do you have lots of money? Then probably not a YouTube channel, because this was back in the day, you know, and so... This was thought, 2012, you know, yeah, it was a different yeah. time for YouTube. <laughs> exactly. And so we decided that it might be cheaper and less technology heavy to do a podcast. And so we basically just started recording our conversations. <laughs> That's really cool. I, I feel like a lot of podcasts kind of start that way. Not all of them do, obviously, but it, it was bringing back some memories of when people sort of asked me why I started mine. I was like, well, I had amazing office hours conversations with my professors mentors and they were some of the best conversations I've ever had and not only was it just great getting to know my professors but like I got such great life advice career advice like all this stuff and then I was like yeah let me just um have these kinds of conversations but like you know just have a microphone record them a little 
just edit them down a little bit and and then <laughs> you know send them out into the world so, no i think it's really cool so once you got into the initial podcast you know how did you decide the direction you wanted to take it like does did you figure okay well, we'll just do it for as long as we can because we enjoy it or was it like you picked like a certain time frame where you're like okay we're gonna take it from a to b and eventually it will have its end or you know what do you envision for it <laughs> Eventually, it will have its end. <laughs> um, I mean, I think initially when we started, I think we, we thought a little bit about like who would be our target audience. So we thought about that quite a bit. And we definitely wanted to pitch it between like sort of general knowledge and high level expertise. So we wanted it to be accessible. We wanted to take the things that were really highly specialized and make them more accessible. And it's like, we've got all of this great knowledge that we've learned from the degrees that we've done. It'd be great for people who are going down that path, but are interested in history to have a taste of what that's a bit, a bit more of what that's like and have a way in. That's not just like watching the history channel and being like, Oh, that's ancient Rome. And every historian everywhere is like, no, that's so wrong. It's factually incorrect. You know, all of this sort of stuff. So it's like, there's got to be a a way that's somewhere in between that. But we didn't really plan out very much necessarily what the direction was. We spent a lot of time just sort of talking exactly about what we knew. And once we'd sort of exhausted all of that, we were like, oh, uh, we we, we need to think of uh, some stuff to talk about now. (laughs) And... That's the moment that we sort of decided that we might try to look at Roman history in the way that the Roman historians used to look at Roman history, which is to start from the very beginning and just to keep moving through and see what happens. At the rate that we're going, I think it will probably take the rest of our lives to get to the (laughs) end. (laughs) So it's highly detailed, very detailed. There's a lot to say. (laughs) Well, that's the the other thing. I think that from the beginning – Looking back, we probably should have thought a bit more about the technology and looked a bit more into that at the time. It took us a while to get our heads around that because the time we ended up starting the podcast, we were also starting our careers. So we were both super busy all the time. You know, squeezing the podcast in was a massive ask, even though we were literally just recording our conversations. To do any preparation and all of that kind of stuff and figure out websites, it, it took everything we had to do it. So that's why we were quite slow, I think, to sort of realize what the technology could do for us. And also, I think it was also the fact that, as we said this before, we kind of started podcasting before. Podcasting was big, but it wasn't, you know, something that everyone was listening to and lots of people were doing back in 2012. It was before Serial was released and all of that kind of stuff. So I think as well, what we could compare to was more limited. You know, there were less indie podcasts that were doing history that we could compare ourselves to. And so... I'm not sure that we were fully aware of the possibilities as well, because when we'd hear a really professional sounding podcast back then, it tended to be from a professional news station or something like that. And so we were like, well, yes, of course they sound like that. They have a sound booth and blah, blah, blah. It took us a while to get our head around that. But the, the main thing as well that we wanted to make sure people could understand for, from our point of view is that the Romans are funny, mostly unintentionally so. <laughs> But we, we thought the Romans were hilarious. And so we wanted to make sure that other people could see the humor in what was happening in the ancient world. Because again, when you read some kinds of history books, which are still very excellent in their own way, they tend to obviously take it all very, very seriously. We wanted to make sure that people understood that, no, it's okay to laugh at this. Like, this is pretty funny. <laughs> Even if it's not an intentional joke on the Romans' behalf, the way that they did this or the way that they thought about this, that's... That's pretty funny. It's okay to laugh at them. And so that was always a part of our show as well. But yeah, I, I think it, was, it wasn't until we started doing the history from the founding of the city that we started to find our groove. We started to work a little bit more with editing. We started to work a little bit more on sound quality. And yeah, so it, it took us a while, but we got there in the end. Nice, nice. I mean, it doesn't seem like such a long time ago, but at the same time, it was such a long time ago compared to where we are now. It was like 2012. I was like, what was I doing in 2012? I mean, I was like, I remember YouTube in 2012. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's remarkable. And the fact that you guys still have more and more content. So I'm sure for everyone who who's listening to this who loves 
the the romans you you will have a lot of content coming out of partial historians for um a very long time so get to it is is what i'll say (laughs) (laughs) we definitely will (laughs) so well and for everyone you've got 10 years of content to catch up on so come on people get listening get listening let's go let's go you know we're up to about 437 bce that's how far we've traveled (laughs) wow okay yeah that's a that's that's a long way man yeah i you know i would love to be like yes i'm gonna i'm gonna listen from the very beginning and go right to present i i just i you know have to find time between thesis and podcast and all these things but i I promise eventually i'll i'll get there hey maybe you guys will make me end up liking rome more you know maybe you'll accomplish what my professors never could sorry guys (laughs) I mean, if you get to laugh at the Romans, surely that's all right. You know, they had some pretty good jokes. You know, I was uh, talking to someone who was telling me about Roman jokes and Cicero and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, okay. They, they, they have some, some redeemable qualities that, that I don't just not enjoy. I think they're at their funniest there when they're actually trying to be very serious. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying really hard, the poor oh, Romans. What a, what yeah. a talent. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you create a lot of fun media for other people, which is awesome, you know. But in terms of what you guys intake for your own media, you know, what are you guys inspired by? You know, are there any particular ancient Rome movies or TV shows that particularly sort of inspire you or that you think were done well? Or do you kind of look at them and just go, this is no, wrong, wrong, terrible, terrible? Because <laughs> there's, there's some good ones that I remember and then there's some really bad ones that I definitely remember. Well, as someone who likes reception studies, I like everything, the good, bad, and the ugly. If it's bad, then that's good for me because it gives me something to write about. If it's good, then I can enjoy it and I can also write about that. So yeah, I, I like everything. As long as they're still just out there making it, give it to me. I'll take it. <laughs> so I still really enjoy HBO's two seasons of Rome. I mean, it's not, you can nitpick it for sure. We move in the sort of circles that do, but I still think that it does a really good job of just capturing a vibe where I'm like, ah, oh, ancient Rome. And you're like, yes. This feels like a real world, um, seeing it through this lens. Having said that, my husband is Italian and I sat down and I was like, we really need to watch this together. And he was freaked out about the accents that everybody had. And he's like, I can't watch Romans with English accents. I can't do this. (laughs) And so he made me put it away again. Doesn't work for everybody, as it turns out. I've tested it against some different uh, cultural malus. So... Definitely one for the Western world thinkers. I still really quite like the Gladiator series as well. Spartacus, Blood and Sands, and yes. the seasons associated with that. They they actually did a really, really fascinating job of... I mean, it was, it was obviously there was imaginative aspects to it, but it was phenomenal in its own way. And I kind of... I, I just love that world coming to life in those particular shows, so... That's good. At least, you know, there's there's some things that won't make all Roman historians' eyes just roll so far into the back of their heads that, you know, they bas- they'll basically get stuck there. You know, it's funny. I do. I, I always talk about how, no, Greece is my jam and that is where I happily will remain. But strangely enough, my favorite ancient world movie is Roman. It's the, the Russell Clo- Crowe gladiator. And so I'm like, it's a classic. It's a classic. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah, film. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. It's perfect. He's like the perfect sort of Roman hero. I don't know. I was like, oh, I hate saying that. <laughs> An Australian, of course. Of course. <laughs> or, or Kiwi, is he? Isn't he? <laughs> shh, shh. We've claimed it for a long I, wait, time. Wait, is he? <laughs> I apologize, by the way. Yeah, he's from New Zealand. Yeah. He's lived in Australia for a long time, but he is a Kiwi. Yeah. See, and that's the thing with Americans. We can't really we don't have a great ear for the small difference in accent oh he sounds australian he does he definitely sounds australian be careful australians (laughs) do like to think that we punch above our our weight on the world stage so you're just you're just reinforcing the myth for us (laughs) (laughs) oh okay well i don't know okay so we have a lot of great and a lot of not great media representation i mean i'm thinking of like that terrible pompeii movie that 
uh, 2015. That, yeah, that, that wasn't that wasn't the best. But as I say, like even if it's bad, then it still gives historians something to write about. That's <laughs> true. You know, I'm I'm no Egyptologist. I well, I I joke that I'm an armchair literary Egyptologist. Some sometimes, but um, I mean, my first love was Egypt, and and I did get some Egyptological classes, like two or three. So you know, I was like, that qualifies me enough to talk about that horrible Gods of Egypt movie that was. Oh yeah, that was terrible. so bad that it's actually good though, right? It's like it's so terrible, so it's actually entertaining in That's what how I mean. bad it is. <laughs> but you know, I was like, yeah, that gave me a lot to write about. Just being like, why? I have this weird relationship with with media and portraying the ancient world because I'm like with Rome, it's always usually height of Rome, everything's great. Okay, you might have a villain who's an evil emperor, but, but the general point is, it's it's like Imperial Rome, it's Republican Rome, whatever. It's good, and so it's doing its thing. Or with Greece, you'll get some sort of fantastical, yes, well, Athens and Sparta are war or whatever, but but it's usually in its height and, you know, fifth century. And then with Egypt, you only get things that are like, Egypt is in ruins. Nothing is built and in its historical, like, like it, you know, it's like the pyramids are always destroyed and all the temples are coming down. And I'm just like, but why are Greece and Rome afforded? Like everything is fifth century or, you know, imperial Rome, whatever. And it's great. And then you just have poor Egypt over here. Who's always, we're destroying it. It's in ruins. Yeah. Like where's our mini series on Amana Egypt? Cause that would be amazing. Yes. Oh my like God. the political yes. intrigue. Like guys, I want to see yes. that. <laughs> Who would they cast to play Akhenaten and Nefertiti? Ooh. Exactly. <laughs> the big questions. The big questions. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I feel like Egypt doesn't get as much attention. Probably I think partially because of obviously the uncomfortable issues around race and what's been privileged in classics and ancient history in the lead up to the time period that we're in now, definitely. But I feel like it also probably has something to do with the fact that the Egyptians for a lot of the history where they were at their height didn't necessarily write history in that kind of narrative way that the Greeks and Romans ended up doing it, maybe. I feel like that's partly it too. Plutarch's just so freaking <laughs> real. <laughs> I mean it's true. They I mean, you know, it's much earlier in history, you know, than than either the, the Greeks or the Romans. But you know, it but it's interesting, like I still find there's there's a lack of things even from like Hellenistic Egypt. I mean, come on, it's basically Romanized at that point. All we have is, well, we have Assassin's Creed Origins now, so you can go discover yeah. Roman Egypt. But I'm still just like, yeah, because it takes place so late, um, well, pyramids are sort of still not in ruin, but they're, they're still, they're not, you know, they don't look like when they were first built. And a lot of the old Egyptian elements and temples, they're heavily Romanized and the original is still gone. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if it's, I, I actually wonder about this in the sense that I feel like it's what Hollywood mostly believes the audiences will be able to digest. And so if you look at even Greece, it doesn't get as many movies as Rome because it's really hard to convey to people that don't necessarily have the background necessary to understand that Greeks spend a lot of time fighting other Greeks. So it's hard to be like, they're the Greeks, they're the good guys, they're the Greeks, they're the bad guys. Like, it's hard to explain the differences between them and why they're fighting, uh, because I think to maybe the average person, they don't necessarily know about the fact that there are all these individual city-states, and yeah, they did spend a lot of time arguing and that sort of thing. And so that makes it a bit complex sometimes to put those sorts of issues on screen. And I feel like with Egypt as well, because you had a situation where you've got, if you were going to make a history about, say, some royals, they're allowed to have multiple wives and they have lots of children. I mean, how do you put Ramses II's family on screen without heavily editing it? <laughs> I mean, you do the what Disney did to Hercules, obviously, you know. <laughs> also a great film. Yeah, not, that, not that I think they shouldn't try, but I think it's, yeah, it's those factors which I think sometimes make movie producers nervous yeah. and therefore like Hollywood and, and people who are in movies that are going to make those big blockbuster type movies that are generally needed if you're going to make something about the ancient world just because the cost involved of sets and costumes and that kind of thing because the business want to make sure that they're going to get their money back they're not necessarily willing to take a risk they tend to be quite conservative with the types of stories that they like to tell 
And so if something's worked in the past, like they're like, oh, people like Rome. We've made Roman films. They like them. Let's just make another one. Like it's, it's that, that kind of way of thinking, I think. <laughs> We've still got the set. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to see some more adventurous filmmaking about, you know, Shep Sush and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I can understand why people might be shy of doing that. But hopefully there's some bra- brave soul out there who doesn't mind risking it all. Yes, people are hesitant about Egypt, but but at least we have stuff on it. We really don't have anything on ancient Assyria, which is something that I'm super mad about. Cause I'm like, give me a Gilgamesh, give me a something. But you know, for all we have about Egypt, you know, people know even less about ancient Assyria or Babylon or whatever. So, you know, you see them in passing, but you're like, oh, it's included as part of someone else's thing. So, you know, I was super happy to see Babylon in the Alexander movie. But then I was like, yeah, but then it's crammed in that horrible Alexander movie. So it's not really about Babylon. Yeah. <laughs> you just sort of see it. it. It's definitely, that's where you can see the the legacy of the privileging of Greece and Rome as being of particular cultural interest to people that want to say, yeah, these are the civilizations that are important and matter and these give us the civilizations, you know, yeah, and, and, they, and they don't privilege other cultures, which, which they should. So yeah, it, that's where you can definitely see that those racial issues coming to the fore. Yeah. Well, okay. So question for both of you. It's a, hopefully a fun one. So obviously we have a lot of uh, adaptations of Rome out there in, in a perfect world. Like if you could make it consult on it or just tell someone to make it, you know, what hasn't been done that you would really love to see? Uh, a biopic of Agrippina the Younger. Absolutely. I've actually, I've actually started writing a script of that a few times. <laughs> Make it. You'll get your Oscar. <laughs> exactly. That, that's, that's the plan. <laughs> I, I'm going to go for something that's really niche, but it's very typical for me. So it won't come as a surprise to Dr. Rad. But I would like to see a film that covers the triple trial of the Vestal Virgins from 114 BCE. Because... Nice. They go through the trial process the first time and two get off and one is found guilty and then things get complicated and there's a second trial and it happens under different conditions and then the other two are also found guilty. So by the end of this whole session, you have lost half of the Vessel Virgin College and it is insane and what is going on? And we have we have like sources around it and people talking about it, but it'd be great to like get into like the characters and it's like you know what are those magistrates like what are those court systems like how are those pontifex dealing with this what are the characters of the women involved did they really sleep with anybody you know i feel like there's so much to explore there so it would definitely be historical fiction in the end (laughs) but it would be such a great courtroom drama yeah great courtroom drama you have to get matthew mcconaughey in there (laughs) (laughs) There are live burials happening every minute in Rome right now. It's insane. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm seeing it unfold. And actually, maybe it's because I'm so terribly influenced by like the last things that I watch. And I just finished that new Netflix courtroom drama, uh, Anatomy of a Scandal with Michelle Dockery. Oh, my God, yes. And so oh, having love. seen <laughs> Michelle Dockery be so badass... In, in her prosecutorial role, I'm like, so can we put her in your adaptation? Because I would love to see that. <laughs> I think she'd make a great Vestal. She's got a very regal look about mm-hmm. her. So, yes, I am there for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, she's just so fabulous. Cast away. <laughs> I was like, if yeah. you write it, yeah. I will cast it. I know people in Hollywood. We will get this made. And then you can win your Oscar for, like, best director best you know screenplay whatever you want we we will make it happen it's a deal it's a deal we're definitely going to make agrippina the younger happen that's that's the big that will be a big ticket seller if we get that screenplay together and it's like enough people are interested in that story i i sometimes just am like <laughs> am i really the only person to think this would be a good idea <laughs> no i i agree i'm i'm yeah paying. I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for heaven's sakes, she goes into exile. She maybe has sex with her brother, uncle, and her son. How is this not a movie? <laughs> she comes back better than yeah. ever. Her mum dies a horrible death in exile, as long, along with two of her brothers. Like, 
There's so much drama. I mean, maybe that's the problem. It's too much drama. She'd need a mini series. <laughs> Come on, Netflix. Come on, HBO. Somebody. Uh, Absolutely. Call me. Call yeah, me. Just yeah. you know. Yeah. No. I mean, there there's a lot of drama, but you know. When I think about who's making these movies and who gets to make the decisions, it's a bunch of men who want to do things like the Eagle. It's just a bunch of dudes who are like, you know, what would be really much better than a series on some like random Roman woman. They'd be like, let's just do a movie about a random Roman dude who probably didn't exist. But let's just make him go and find the like the, the lost Eagle. And they're like, that's a great seller. You know what? Like. Boom, funded, let's go. We solved it, guys. We- exactly, it's like, and who are they going to fight? Oh, let, let's make them fight the picks. Perfect, oh, yes, like, like here's your money, here's a budget of, you know, 50, you know, 100 mil, go make, you know, and I'm like, but what if I wanted to pitch you on, no, no, no. You know, but Livia got a, a mini series recently, so I mean, it's not all bad news for Roman women. Okay, that's Yeah, true. Domina, Domina, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's maybe starting to change, because I must admit, I loved the opening credits to that you show. You did, okay. They were okay. awesome. Because I, I yeah, see it. it if you, you don't know what I'm talking it's hard to describe without it not sounding a bit flat. So I encourage you to go and Google the opening credits to Domina. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's pretty cool. Okay. Because I've seen it advertised, but I haven't, it wasn't available for me to watch anywhere for free. And I was like, I refuse to pay for this. So I was like, I'll just wait for someone to get it and then I'll watch it. And I'm like too scared to pirate it. So I'm like, okay, well. It takes some interesting angles, but uh, I stand behind the opening credits, definitely. (laughs) Just the opening credits. (laughs) Okay, okay. No, I could could, could totally get behind that. As much as I like the current media that we're getting, yeah, I'm like, you know, just have some historians hopefully help speed up the process, make things that are super entertaining, a little more historically accurate than other things. And, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in if you don't like what's there, create something yourself. And so when I was upset with some portrayal when I was younger, I decided I was going to play The Sims and I made my entire village Greek-Roman village where they all had Greek and Roman names. <laughs> And then I was like, how can I, I was like, they made an emoji movie. So I'm like, can you make a Sims movie? That's all like ancient people, please. I don't think that's going to get made anytime soon, but I feel like historians would be really great for, for consulting on it. (laughs) Keep pitching. You just got to keep getting out there. Or make it myself, right? Just learn to code and then learn animation and then animate the movie myself, basically, right? Intense, but possible. (laughs) (laughs) You find super specific things as you're doing the research of the first one and you just move on exactly. from exactly yes yes okay that is new life goal okay so all i will end this with is, is saying you know someone take any of our good media ideas go forth and create um people will consult don't take agrippina no that is okay mine. so so don't take agrippina <laughs> leave that so you can win your oscar on that idea yeah, everything else exactly. is fair game now that we have firmly put the ball in Hollywood's court. I sort of end the interview portion of the podcast with three last questions and they're, they're pretty short. So the first one is when you guys were in undergrad or grad school, did you attend office hours? No, I'm not sure that Australia does this kind of thing. No, we don't. It's not really a thing for us. I mean, the academics who are our teachers sometimes have hours when you can drop by and like, get your assignments and stuff like that. But yeah, office hours is an American thing, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I'll combine the last two then because they kind of go hand in hand. Having gone through like PhD programs and, and seen how academia works, do you think office hours though generally is a good idea? And if you do think it would be a good idea, why should someone go to office hours in your opinion? I'm going to assume that office hours is a time where the professor's like look my door is open and you're welcome to drop by and have a chat about anything you like yeah come and talk I think there is a huge value in having the accessibility of senior academic staff to students you would always want to have the door open for office hours I assume you would not want to be in a closed office situation goodness knows but what you do want, I think, is the capacity to be able to have casual conversation about life, what is actually going on, like your questions about your degree structure that you can't ask anybody. And, you know, admin is always like, it's kind of like 
universities are bureaucratic places in many respects and I always feel like you have to have a degree to understand how to get a degree. Um, so having access to somebody who knows that kind of stuff is super useful, particularly if you're like a first gen student coming through and it's like not knowing the ropes, like how does this even work? And I think this is where you also develop like mentoring friendships as well. And I would say that like within an Australian context, those sorts of things are possible and do happen. They don't have this sort of formal office hour structure around it. But at least where I was doing the PhD at Sydney, there was a really close knit postgrad community and there was great accessibility to the academics that you worked with and the academics in the department. And it wasn't on a formal basis, but there were lots of ways in which you could connect with them and have those kinds of conversations, go for coffee, have a beer together, things like that. So... Yeah, I think it's super, super valuable. Yeah, I agree. But having said that, I think that there is, it's also important to acknowledge that the strain that's being placed on anybody involved in education, including at the university level, it's getting out of hand, at least in Australia anyway. There's increasing pressure on anybody involved in teaching to do it all, to do lots of things. So if you were to introduce something like office hours, I think you'd have to also take into consideration what else is on the plate of those people because between teaching preparing for classes marking administration and god knows what else and on top of which the the pay in australia often isn't great even if you are at the academic level it depends on you know who you are and what kind of role you have and i know that i think it's, i believe it's also a problem in other places like the uk as well So I think that all of that kind of stuff has to be taken into consideration if you're going to impose something like that on someone's time. Yeah, completely valid. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, it's Mm. interesting hearing from from a place where it's not super common because I think we do sort of take it for granted. I'm sort of fascinated by how people treat office hours uh, in the U.S. just because, you know, it's something that your professor always says, okay, and my office hours are here or they're listed on the syllabus or, you know, and then they're basically begging you to come talk to them. You know, I've often heard a lot of professors saying, please come talk to me because I'm bored because I'm sitting in my office for the hour and a half, whatever that I have. And they're like, I'm staring at the wall. I'm twiddling my thumbs. I'm not doing anything. Or they're presumably just like doing work and waiting for a student to come. So it's really interesting to hear from where you guys are, how that this is not the case. They, they don't just have like a free hour where they're just sitting at the wall, begging someone to come talk to them. So, but also with our super, availability a lot of students I see unfortunately don't take advantage because they're like oh that's weird I don't want to just like go sit in a room and talk to my professor that's weird you know so look and I completely understand that I feel like when I was an undergraduate student in particular I was super shy and the idea that I would ever talk to any of the people that were teaching me was just it was too much I I wouldn't turn up out of embarrassment if I thought that that was a thing that I could do I was like (laughs) They're like, just go and talk to your lecturer. And I was like, no. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I know so many people who didn't. I, I was the weird kid who I lived in my professor's office hours. But also because, I mean, they would offer so many great advices and things that were completely non accurate I got tax help from my professor because I was like, I don't know how to do taxes. <laughs> help me. And they were like, oh, here, I'll show you how to itemize and do this, that, and the other thing. And I was like, Okay, that's the thing. That and um, my favorite professor, she had a chocolate drawer so I could just go grab chocolate whenever I wanted to. And even when she had to go teach a class, she'd be like, you can use my office if you want to do homework in it. And I was like, yes, you are the best person ever. So, yeah, I I used it for non-academic things just as much as academic (laughs) things. So I I will admit to that. But, yeah, how interesting to learn that it's not really a thing in, in Australia. Hmm. More, more casual. I mean, I, as, as Peter said, I definitely think that we had access to people. It wasn't like a lack of access. It just was not formalized. Yeah. It's, yeah. Inter- it's interesting to hear. I did not I did not know that. So now uh, at, at the end of each podcast, I usually ask my guests if they would read Shelley's Ozymandias. So, yeah, once you've read the poem, both of you, if you could just sort of Give me your, you know, quick initial thoughts on, you know, the power of this poem. What do you think it means? And, you know, we sort of regard this poem quite highly as, as one of the best poems uh, written. And so I'm just curious to see, you know, do you agree with that assessment? And if so, why? And if not, also, why? 
I'm intrigued because I usually hate poetry. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hit me with it. Yeah. I'm taking the task of, of reading the poem. I will preface this by saying I, I taught English literature for many years and in the course of that, never taught this poem. <laughs> so, but that's, that's okay. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I'm going to leave Dr. Rad for the reaction. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's a, it sounds like a very romanticized view of ruins, which I feel like is in keeping for the time that I imagine Shelley would have been writing this. 1818. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not shocked. I feel like, yeah, that fits with how people looked at that kind of stuff. <laughs> I feel my usual frustration with poetry, which is just say what you want to say and <laughs> stop beating around the bush, but... <laughs> Look, I love how there is a sense of like reaching through time that comes through this piece because it's it's a both it's both the physical but it's also the metaphysical because it's the idea of being spoken to by this figure as well. And the idea that not only really classic line, look on my works, ye mighty and despair, but we're in the midst of ruins. So whatever it was. There's nothing, there's nothing left to be seen except the claim of that greatness. And in a way, that's kind of like the myth of every person, isn't it? I think, you know, deep down, it's like we're all kind of like a little bit of a myth ourselves. And it's like, look at this. And it's like, we'll all just be bodies in the dust as well. And so I'm going to have to do some more thinking. But uh... no, I mean, I know what you mean. Like, definitely. No, de definitely. We are. Uh as a species, very obsessed with our legacy and the idea of needing to leave something behind, needing to somehow outsmart death <laughs> uh, and leave some testament to our existence. So, yeah, I can I get where you're coming from, Dr. G. <laughs> and we thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And our podcast, our legacy, mm. Mm, continues on through time. Mm. Well, theoretically, I mean, we, we actually just, I actually just registered us for this uh, project, which the name escapes me now, and I apologize to the project, who are trying to make sure they preserve all the records around podcasts, because of course, we're assuming that the people of the future will be able to access the kinds of files that we're using and the kind of technology that we're using. But what if they can't? It'll be like the way of the Walkman. <laughs> R.I.P. to the Walkman. Yeah. Ooh. Portable CD players, I remember those. Ooh, what a vibe. Yeah. You would walk around and have this giant thing either in your hand or in your pocket, and people would just be like, seriously, dude? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember trying to go for a run with a Walkman. It was uh, generally something that flew off my belt within the first couple of, like, paces. <laughs> what a throwback. What a throwback. I am not a huge poetry fan. I'm not someone who just will sit and read sort of pastoral poetry and be like, oh, yes, this is it, man. Nah, that's not me. I'm like, ugh, poetry. It's confusing. It's ridiculous. But this is the one exception. I read this for the first time when I was pretty young in school. I don't remember exactly what year, what grade, but I just remember. And it stuck with me. And then I encountered it again at some point during my years at university and then it was the inspiration for the initial podcast as well i think it i was influenced also by sort of the the, the political situation in the u.s that i was uh living through as well but because to me this poem has always been uh, a political statement by shelley 
where he talks sort of about the ephemeral nature of political power, you know, this idea that to me, the, the entire poem's a memento mori, right? Where it's like a, a, rem a reminder that you will die. So living through the end of the Trump years where he tried to say, no, 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 what, what I've built is a lasting legacy. And to some extent, I, I will agree because he has wrought sort of changes that are sort of semi-permanent for at least the next generation. So I'm kind of like, I mean, he's not, he's, he's, He's right, but he's also not right. So just it the, the poem hit sort of differently for me there. It, it, it's not the worst poem I've ever heard. I'll give you that. I don't mind. Because it's beautifully <laughs> written, I, right? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, look, it, it is, it is. And look, I can't really, uh, I can't really fault you for that because our, our podcast is, our name is from a Jane Austen work. So, The History of England by a Partial Prejudiced and Ignorant Historian. So, I get it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I kind of love, though, that the takeaway is Dr. Rad's verdict. Shelley, not a terrible poet. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I was clearly robbed of my chance in academia. I mean, my thought process is just so sophisticated. <laughs> Boils it right down to... Ugh, poetry okay Shelley, you're not that bad yeah okay okay yeah <laughs> like the only poet i ever You'll responded do, to was i only liked emily dickinson <gasps> she's the only poet i ever liked. i love oh, her yeah. i mean okay i just finished yeah. watching apple plus's dickinson tv show which is the best thing ever so if you haven't <laughs> yeah if yeah, you haven't yeah. watched it you have to watch it but yeah it is it is on my list i was gonna list. say it's yeah. insane and and, and i yeah, love it no it's <laughs> amazing so everyone should watch that um and and i was so inspired so i got a, a the entire collected works a, a book of all of her poems and i'm so excited i'm like yeah, yes yes so i'm looking at that with new eyes but yeah kind of this, this idea though that you know you can't go it alone you do kind of need help you know the impermanence of everything so the last question i kind of ask every single guest on the show and it's one of my favorites because it, it's the answers are always just so different are uh, if we consider what shelley's saying about the impermanence of everything and then if we consider our modern contemporary society do we have a modern Ozymandias of sorts? You know, something that we think was so great, so amazing, it's going to last forever. But like realistically, it, when future humans look back, whether that be, I used to say like a thousand years, but I was like, LOL, climate change. So we're probably going to die. So I'm not that um, optimistic. So I say like 200 years, maybe <laughs> if we make it that long. So a thousand, 200 years, whatever you'd like to think, you know, if someone were to look back at our time now, would they hold the same opinion that, yeah, it's so great and amazing, or will it have been forgotten about completely? Ooh, that is such a big question. I mean, so much of what we do these days is digital. That, again, I sort of come back to that question of it depends on how they can access our technology, I think, in order to understand our society right now. Certainly, I feel like a lot of people have this sense that we are, we have progressed to this point and humans have never been better, which is obviously a, a, sorry, a, a type of thinking that is not new to this generation. I think a lot of people think that about their civilization. But I definitely think that if certain things about our society survive the test of time, like abattoirs, I don't know that people are going to have the highest opinion of our ability to kill millions of animals in a brutal and cruel fashion. It just depends, I suppose. I, yeah, I, I like you also tend to take a bit of a, a bleak look at things in the sense of, I wish humans were better able to respond to things like climate change in a faster and more pragmatic way than they seem to be. So yeah, I, I suppose I do take a bit of a bleak, bleak look at what's going to be left of our society. This is hard because I feel like it's all just going to be a wasteland. That's the real problem. Sorry, not a lot of optimism on often no. here. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, are we getting the plastic out of the ocean or is the ocean yeah. just going to become covered in plastic? And, you know, all marine life that we know about and probably marine life that we don't know about um, continues to suffer. Will we find that our cities become completely uninhabitable and so much of the modern city you can kind of interchange one like sort of like landscape for another, like cities kind of all kind of look the same. They're all just covered in glass. And I was like, it's going to be completely, I mean, it's a cheap product, but 
you know, at some point we're not going to be able to live in glass buildings. Like we're just, we won't have the resources to keep them cool enough to make them habitable. There might just be cities of glass just sitting yeah, there maybe, in the landscape. Maybe there'll be, yeah, lots of glass buildings that have been abandoned as people, yeah. If people just live in the car parks underground of those buildings. I don't know. <laughs> this is bleak. <laughs> After this bleakness, I will say the thing is that nothing is ever written. I hate the word inevitable. And we do still have mm. a limited window of action to, you know, to take those opportunities and make a difference. And whilst governments and businesses have to be the ones that step up here, at the same time, every little thing that you do as an individual also counts. It's taken note of by governments, by corporations. I mean, hello, they're spying on you all the time when you're on the internet. So when you click on something, when you buy something, when you vote for something, you are deciding on the future that humanity has. So I really hope that we're wrong about this. <laughs> I hope that the future is going to have lots of beautiful buildings with, you know, highly effective solar panels. And, you know, I, I hope the future is going to be amazing and we still have a chance to do something about that. But with every day that you choose to feel overwhelmed, with every day that you choose to ignore it or feel angry about it, you're losing opportunities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the the great thing about this question is that there's not meant to be a right answer. There's there's no wrong answers here. It's it's super subjective. You know, and every uh, every answer is different. So I really enjoy these. Yeah, I'm I'm also a bit you know fearful for the future. Are we still gonna have like the Great Barrier Reef? I hope so. Um, I hope my kids can go scuba diving in it. But um, we'll we'll see how terrible our current government cares about it more than the previous that's one. what i heard <laughs> so i'm like okay maybe yeah. maybe there's hope <laughs> hopefully i think we tend to be a little bit more bleak about it because our country is one that gets very hot in summer like very yeah. hot we know we've with climate change we are commonly now having multiple days over 40 degrees celsius in our summers and we've had to watch people go through droughts we've had to watch people go through floods recently and fires of course like not that we are suffering, uh, not that we're on the front lines. There are obviously countries that are much worse off and already have millions of climate refugees and people who don't have water and that kind of stuff. But certainly you'd have to be blind, deaf and dumb not to notice what's going on in Australia. And so, yeah, I think we're just, we tend to yeah. be a little bit pessimistic because of what we've seen and what we live through. And I feel like Europe's starting to get a taste of it. The summer that Europe is experiencing at the moment is not at all a surprise for how Australian summers are. And I can see the outrage building because, and I can see that the way that the UK just looks like, it it looks like Australia at the moment. It's like, you know, the, the grass is dry, places are duff balls. And I was like, that's what this country has often been like yeah yeah and i mean this could not be more relevant i guess i'm sitting in the uk where it is currently like 32 degrees and i'm like no no this is the uk this is unacceptable mm -hmm. i mean this is the that's, that's hot for the uk the... yeah for, for us that's normal then. yeah i was like no this is like <laughs> let's see i got to the uk on tuesday it is now sunday and every single day including the day i arrived it has been in the mid 30s and no clouds, no rain, no nothing. And because this country is not set up to handle this, there's no AC. So every day we're just sort of dying in the heat like, oh my gosh. But I actually, as much as that's, that's obviously like a horrible thing for people to live through, I actually think that's also a positive in the sense that people need to feel yeah. these things to actually want to do something about it because even if we do manage to not cross the tipping point in six, seven years, we're still going to be living very different kinds of lives because of the choices that we've made. Like it's not going to be a matter of fixing it, not fixing it, life staying the same, life being different. Our lives are going to be different. Our lives are going to change because we've let it go too far. And so there's going to be repercussions, even if we stick to the lower estimates. And so people need to understand that, yeah, this is what your life is going to be like now. It is going to be more disrupted. It is going to be more extreme weather. And that's just the best case scenario. <gasps> that's the thing. You know, this is the best case scenario. So you, that's why it's so important to act because we're going to be uncomfortable and we're going to suffer more than we needed to if we'd done something 10, 15 years ago. So yeah, if you don't want it to be worse than that, if you don't want it to be more dramatic than it currently is, then yeah, 
do whatever you can. It's better to practice sustainability and climate change action imperfectly than to give up on even trying because you think if I can't be perfect, what's the point? For sure. I mean, and, you know, at least coming to the UK, I've seen people are trying. I mean, I just lived for, you know, a yeah. year in Greece where there's there's no, like, plastic recycling. They don't really do anything. You know, I was traveling in Turkey and in Egypt. Again, no consideration for that. And, well, but before I left Greece uh, for the last, like, two weeks I was there, it was pretty much 30, between 36 and 38 every single day. No clouds, no rain super humid and I was like I'm going to die (laughs) um I'm you know a pampered little American who needs her AC and uh um living in Greece where they just really don't and then you know with the energy crisis they're like okay we're gonna make it hotter you can't use your AC and you're like it's 38 degrees I need AC (laughs) so you're like uh so yeah either way um I hope that the future is filled with more optimism than we're giving it we will see but i did want to ask where can people find you guys absolutely they can find us on pretty much every podcast platform thanks to dr g's technological skills as well as instagram twitter and facebook but twitter is probably where we are most active and hopefully in a couple of months we'll also have our first joint book project coming out Oh, that's exciting. Thank you both for joining me today. It's, it's It's gone by super quickly. You know, wish we had more time. But I will just have to have you both back on in the future, obviously. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for having us. us. It's been a real pleasure. Right. Trireme Transit is now departing ancient office hours. Next stop is Present Ponderings. <laughs>